how to change culture and in and, and a very like simplistic, like straightforward way, let me know because you could make millions, honestly, in a correction for a correctional facility because it's really hard. And I think that's it's it's challenging in and of itself and it's not something that happens overnight and so it really is something that takes time and that's hard to wait for for culture to change um, but in order to change things related to priya and sexual violence yeah implementing the standards will help absolutely but i think i really do believe it's a bigger systemic change to the culture of that facility um, and so that's why you know it's important you know what we see sometimes is um, there'll be someone who's tasked with implementing, overseeing the implementation of these standards. And that's, some people are allowed, like that's their only job. Some people it's sort of like a tack on to, you know, as other things as shall be assigned to their job. And then what happens is, is that they end up, they're the only ones doing it. And there's no buy-in. If we don't have buy-in from the administration, you're certainly not gonna get buy-in from the rest of the staff about these standards. Um, so it's incredibly challenging to, to not only change the culture, but to you know, really kind of retrofit these facilities and get to thinking, you know, making sure that there aren't all these larger issues going on at the facility and addressing those as well. So PREA implementation can't take place in isolation. Um, so you know, when I talked with Francesca, I know last time I think you talked about um, girls in juvenile facilities, right? So um, she and I talked about me focusing a little bit more about juveniles and adult prisons and jails. And I think I mentioned to some of you at the beginning, the challenge is, is that there's not a lot that we know. So the Bureau of Justice Statistics, um, they fall under Department of Justice, they're the research arm. They've been doing surveys around PREA um, for a number of years. And so they do a couple of things. So one, they do administrative surveys. So they go out and um, all correctional facilities Definitely state um, juvenile facilities and state adult facilities, and I think maybe even jails, excuse me just a moment. Um, they have to submit a form every year. It's called the Survey of Sexual Violence, the SSV. Um, and it's just like the stats about what's happened at that facility over that, the course of that past year related to PREA. You know, how many incidents have been reported, how many have been substantiated, how many have been unfounded, this kind of thing. So it's very administrative. But that's only helpful if it's actually being reported, right? Like, if no one's reporting that they've been sexually victimized, the administration's not going to have that data. Um, and let alone if they're keeping the data appropriately or, you know, even reporting the right information back to the feds. So that's one of the ways that they've been collecting information. The other way is that they've been going out and they've been doing surveys of inmates and residents. Um, and residents, by residents, I mean um, juveniles and juvenile facilities. So they've done a series of um, surveys and they do them ACASI, which is um, it, basically it's computer assisted interviewing. So they have an interview, it's set up on a computer. Inmates are randomly selected to come down and take the survey. And if very early on there's questions asked of them around um, making reports of sexual violence, um, if they've reported anything, and if the answer is no, then they get kicked out to an alternative survey. Um, if they answer yes, then they stay with, with the survey um, from BJS and answer those questions. But the idea being that everyone takes about the same amount of time for a survey, so say 30 minutes. So, you know, if I go in and take the survey and I don't report anything, but Victoria comes in and I come right back to my, my living unit, but then Victoria is in there for like 45 minutes and then comes back, people pick up on that, that something was different. Like, why, Tara, did you only have to be in there for 10 minutes, yet she was in there for much longer? So they try to keep things equal so as not to discourage people from actually participating in the surveys. It is voluntary. Um, so they do these in um, adult prisons, adult jails, juvenile facilities, um, and they've even done a survey of inmates who have been released from facilities um, as sort of a retrospective to say what happened at the facility you were in. So not every facility gets surveyed. Um, they do do a random selection. Um, excuse me, the Bureau of Justice Statistics is getting ready within the next year or so to do another round of surveys both in juvenile facilities and in adult facilities. Um, as you can imagine, they're very time and resource intensive. Um, but the challenge, frankly, with getting data about youth and adult facilities is there aren't that many youth and adult facilities. And so it's a matter of um, when they go in, 
you know, they have to be selected. I, I don't know, and I, I apologize, I didn't, I realize this now, I didn't go back and read the all the literature to see if they are actually like oversampling, you know, deliberately over oversampling youth. Um, I'm not sure, but, but at the end of the day, there just aren't that many youth that are being held in adult facilities, which, you know, is a catch-22. One, we don't know what's going on with them, but two, it makes, begs a question, you know, how at risk and how, um, vulnerable are they in these settings because there aren't very many of them and so they might be very isolated or you know preyed upon in some way um, but these are some risk factors that have come out um, I, I think most of these are from um, a lot of these are from adult facilities so they may not um, all necessarily apply to youth in adult facilities but this is just sort of an overview about what some of those risk factors are so what I did is I went through the surveys and I sort of pulled out, okay, well, what do we, what do we know? Um, and so this is, again, sexual victimization in adult prisons and jails, inmate on inmate. Um, and so the first one here is about juveniles. So 1.8% of the juveniles who were surveyed had experienced sexual violence as compared to adults in uh, uh, prisons and in jails. Again, because the N value, the number of youth is so small, they had to aggregate the um, for prisons and jails so that's why this is lumped together it's not broken out prisons and one for jails um, but you can see like it's not that different actually in terms of the rates um, and if we get a chance I could skip down and show you the rates for juveniles and juvenile facilities the rates in juvenile facilities is a lot lot higher and not so much with um, inmate on inmate it's actually um, I'll get to it in a minute but staff sexual misconduct in juvenile facilities of female staff perpetrating sexual violence against males in juvenile facilities, that's where the biggest problem is. Across all correctional facilities, that is the biggest problem. Um, so here's just sort of that this information broken down. You can see here, so inmate on inmate, and this is for adults and juveniles. Again, the, the power just wasn't there to break it out for one or the other. Um, <coughs> Two thirds. Oh no, I'm sorry. I did. I was able to break this out for juveniles. So two thirds indicated they had been victimized more than once. Um, you know, there was threat um, or actual force used. Um, you know, almost 79% of the time, they're pressured by the perpetrator. Injuries did occur. And look at this. This is so sad. Fewer than one in six actually reported the incident. Um, so that's why, you know, this, this nature of changing the culture and especially with respect to Priya, making it a reporting culture um, is so critical. In fact, one of the funny things is that, it's funny, it's not really funny, any of this, but correctional facilities were all up at arms because they'd say, oh my gosh, like, we're now, like, we've been working on implementing Priya and now our reports have gone through the roof. Well, that was to be expected, right? Like before no one felt like they could report or that anything would be done if they did report. Yet now you've instituted a culture of reporting. So yeah, the numbers are gonna go up. I, I feel like it's one of these things like it's gonna shoot up and then it will find sort of like the new normal. Um, and that's exactly what people are finding is that it does shoot up. Um, you know, sometimes also you like institute a new reporting method like one of the things that they have to do is have ways to report inside the facility and then one way that's external to the facility um, or to the agency. And so, you know, if they've got like a new hotline set up, yeah, they get a lot of phone calls. But when at the end of the day, they kind of sift through the nature of those calls, they're not all reports of sexual violence. But the fact that people are trusting that that system is there and wanting to sort of test it out to see if it can be trusted, that's an important thing. And so, yeah, the rates do kind of shoot up. Um, so then this is of staff sexual misconduct, um, again, in adult prisons and jails. So yes, it is higher. Um, juveniles in adult prisons and jails are experiencing sexual um, violence at the hands of staff at a greater numbers than adults in prisons or adults in jails. But not, um, if, you, if you read the reports from the Bureau of Justice Statistics, you'll find that they, they don't, you know, it's not like statistically significant, the, the differences between these numbers. Um, and again, just sort of summary about um, the youth who have been victimized. Um, again, repeated victimization is on this list as well. Um, force or threat of force. A um, little bit less in terms of the number um, who reported being injured as a result of the violence. Um, but look at this, it's even worse in terms of reporting. Only one in 10 are reporting, which frankly, I'm sure that if I were in their situation and I was sexually assaulted by 
a staff member, I'd probably be a little bit hesitant to make a report too. Like, can you really trust other staff at the facility to be able to make a report? Um, I'll, I'm gonna shoot, go here. So these are, um, one of our partners, Just Attention International, they went through all these surveys and put together some really interesting graphics. Um, we'll probably only hit on a couple of them today because we don't have much time left. Um, but in the slide deck, if, if you get it from Francesca, you'll see there's um, some really interesting graphics. Um, but this is, you know, like, why don't people tell? Why don't people report that this happened, right? Embarrassed or ashamed, don't want anyone to know, thought staff would not investigate. So I think no one's gonna do anything about this even if I do tell them. Um, you know, afraid of being punished by staff or afraid of the perpetrator. I mean, the list goes on and on and it's even more cute, again, sort of in that confinement setting where it is this isolated universe um, and people can't get away from their perpetrators. Um, so this is the, the standard that we talked about. Let me pause there before I get into um, this part because we have about, I guess, about 14 minutes left, but I wanted to sort of pause and see what questions you have. I know I haven't asked, answered your question yet about interviewing, so I will get to that. Um, I do. Yeah. Um, so when you talked about the screening, I'm sorry to go back to this. It's okay. Um, when you talked about the screening when you get into facilities, mm -hmm. what is the impact of that screen screening? Are you placed in other, so like a place in another place? What, like, is specifically about the perpetrator screening? Yeah, do you mind if I sit down? I'm going to sit down and we'll just chat. Uh-huh, go so ahead. What is the impact? Like, what is the like end goal what actually happens yeah. okay so the idea is is that you're screened at every facility that you go to so let's let's use Department of Corrections for, as an example because they're they're an interesting one because often you know they have um, under a Department of Corrections there are multiple facilities and oftentimes what happens is, is that there's an intake facility so everyone that's coming from county jail or whatever that's sentenced to the state they come to this um, main facility um, so they get screened there and that is could be a number of things what, how they're going to use that screening information it could be um, to help with determining their classification level um, you know there's varying amounts of times that people you know length of time that people stay at that intake facility so it does it's also used for housing decisions um, and it may be in, in the case of a, a intake facility also be a little bit of a determination about what facility they go to next However, if I go, you know, say there's five facilities, after I go through my intake screening and I get shipped out to facility A, I have to be rescreened. So it can't just be a default, like they're just gonna take at face value everything that was screened, the information collected that first facility, if that makes sense. Because again, like the cultures are different across all those facilities. And so, and frankly, maybe, you know, when I first come, maybe it's my first time in prison, I'm scared out of my mind, uh, you know, and I come into that um, intake facility, I may not be very willing to share a lot of information. So when I get transferred to that other facility, I undergo screening again um, to kind of verify the information that was collected, if there's any new information. Um, and then it's really used for housing decisions to make sure, and it's not to say that you can't house a victim with a perpetrator, you just need to make sure that there are protections in place so that people are staying safe. It's sort of like the first, I don't know, almost like the first step in helping to prevent this from happening at all is like, let's make smart housing decisions. Um, one of the other things too is that that's, it doesn't just sort of stop there. They also have to be rescreened. And I think in adult facilities, it's like 30 days after that initial screening at that facility, just to make sure that there isn't additional information that's come to light. Think about a jail. When I'm in a jail, you come in, you might be someone you may be detoxing. You may be, um, you know, having some kind of mental health crisis when you first come in, and so that screening may not be a true, accurate representation about who you really are, your needs, your risks, that kind of thing. And so that's also why it's important to do a rescreening um, at a certain period of time after you've come into a facility. Juveniles at juvenile facilities it's the same thing, except there's a shorter period of time between them entering and getting screened and that rescreening. I think it's instead of 30 days, I think it's 10. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm just so sorry. Of it's okay. I don't want to monopolize anyone else. No, no, you're fine. Has there ever been any research done on like the way in which race and perceptions, because I know there's a lot of understanding mm. of like how perpetrate, like who is a perpetrator and who is a victim, yeah. plays into then those decisions to place people. Because when I heard like, mm. oh, you're screening people, I was like, oh, that doesn't sound good. Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know. I haven't heard of any research around those lines. Um, you know, what's really hard is developing of these screening instruments at all. Um, and, and 
in some respects, it's not even like the creation of the screening instrument that's hard, right? Like I think we could probably 